Uh, we had a great start last week with Eva Hart telling the story of how God worked in her life. Tonight, you're going to have the opportunity to hear from Jim Spikes. You know, every leader wants to have that person who's willing to do whatever you ask, who just puts their head down and works every day, never complains, goes the extra mile. Uh, that person who doesn't wait for things to come to him, but, but goes after uh, whatever's in front of him. And for us, that is Jim Spikes. And so we are glad to have Dr. Jim Spikes as our guest here tonight. And so Jim, welcome Thank you. to Good This to Is here. My Story. We're so excited to be able to hear how God's been at work in your life. And so if yeah. you will, just begin by telling us a little bit about your story. Okay. Well, uh, my story starts like a lot of other people in the Deep South. I was raised in a Christian home, went to church most of my life, uh, walked down the aisle when I was seven or eight years old and got baptized and all that. And, but the difference being that in my case, it really didn't take. You know, I, I played the game. I walked down and made that decision because I saw some other friends of mine doing that and I kind of saw the, what the, the applause that they got or the recognition. So that looked good. And so I went on down and did my thing. And having grown up in the church, I knew the language. I knew the conversation. And so as I went through, I played the game through my early teen years and mid-teen years, I played the game at church. I do the language, follow things through. But in another part of my life, I was going down a different path. Internally and with other areas of my life, I followed other things. And I was interested in most things that guys are when they're interested in when they're 17, 18 years old, 16 years old, girls and excitement and thrills and just whatever. So I was pursuing that. But I kept it quiet. It was on the radar. It was on my. It was kind of like two different lives, to be almost to be honest. And as I was going through that, as I got older, toward the end of my teenage years, toward my twenties, and thinking about college, I began to notice that none of that was filling me. It was a growing dissatisfaction because part of my nature is I'm a very internal person, and I have to have purpose in life. And after a while, I the more success or the more I achieved here or there, the more I gained. It became less and less satisfying. As I got older, I began to realize that the more I was involved in certain things and looking to satisfy some of those desires in my life, I was getting less and less satisfied. And I began to really question the purpose of my life. On the surface, everything going well, friendly, but on the inside, really just a slow dying process. As I began to realize that if this didn't satisfy me, what would 30 or 40 years more of this same stuff do? Mm, good point. And it wouldn't satisfy me. Yeah. And I began to get more depressed. I reached out to some friends and really they were in the same boat I was. And, and really at the time I was very friendly but very self-centered, driven by my own needs, my own desires. And so I really wasn't a very good friend. Mm. And so when I reached out to people, I got what I sowed. Mm. A biblical proverb, you reap what you sow. Right. And so I just began to really question to the point where it was really just a deep and drawing depression where I didn't, wasn't ready to live the next 40 or 50 years of my life on what I thought was a squirrel wheel, now, a gopher how, wheel. About how old were you at this point? I was about uh, 18, 19. I finished my first okay. year in college, okay. had a scholarship, um, was on a track team at one at a university, had full scholarship, academic and uh, athletic. And that summer it reached a crisis. A couple things happened in my life that forced me to realize the emptiness of my life and had no other means because I, I was a good Christian kid and guy. And so if I couldn't really confess it to anybody, it just began to eat at me. And that summer I began to realize that I'm not ready to live the next 50 years of my life. So I began to contemplate what would it look like to end it right here. And I remember sitting in my room on July 23rd at two o'clock in the morning, making that decision going, well, it's gonna have to, something's gonna have to break. Something's gonna have to change in my life. And thinking, well, the one change I can make was right there in front of me on the table, on my desk. And that's when I heard the, the Lord's voice really for the first time saying, Jim, if you're done, I want it. I want your life. Mm -hmm. And so my prayer of faith in essence was, it simply said, Lord, if you really want my life, I've learned that in Sunday school and I heard that, but if you want it, it's yours. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. And so I woke up the next morning and be honest, I didn't feel the same, didn't feel any different. But the problem, the difference was, it wasn't my problem anymore. God, this is your hands now. You take care of that. 
And at that point, I began to realize I needed to change. I needed to leave Mobile. I left the scholarship behind. I found a, a place, a, a roommate, a, a guy that I knew in college, high school that had started University at Auburn. I said, let me just go to Auburn. So I went to Auburn. He's a brand new Christian in essence. I've made that statement of faith. And I went to Auburn and began there. And, and, uh, and God began to take care of me. And one thing I remember very clearly is that when I got to Auburn, very new believer, not sure what to do, not sure where to plug in at there. And I met a guy who walked across campus in a certain part of the campus where I was at, in the, the science part. And he was a guy who had been a part of our youth group in our in my school or my, my, my church for a number of years, a couple years older than me, Bobby Wojohn. And we met each other on the quad there in, in Auburn. He said, you know, why don't you come with me tonight to a LTC, Campus Crusade for Christ leadership thing. Yeah. And I said, great, I'll show up there. He came, he was there. I met him there. He got me plugged in that night, the next night. And then I never saw him again. Mm. Found out later, the next semester, he transferred to another school. In my mind, God had placed him on that campus, on that part of campus, because he would never go there normally. He was a business major and he's on the other side of campus. He was there, he found me and we saw each other and got me connected to uh, what really became the prim primary instance of my discipleship as a new Christian. And so I began to grow in my faith there, but also still being stubborn. I wanted to do science things, mm -hmm. had my life plotted out. I was going to do a doctorate study in some areas. And so, and I began, but also to be involved in ministry and working with students and discipling other guys. And finally came to a head about that future decision and wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do this. And so I was in the library and I was thinking about doing doctrinal dissertations, looking it through. This is before internet. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do it the hard way. You open right. the books up and you thumb through <laughs> abstracts. <laughs> Old school. Old yeah. school, you yeah. know. And I remember seeing one abstract there of a guy who was planning to spend four years of his life doing a really such a detailed, minute study in some kind of area that was, and I think, I thought to myself, and the Lord said to me, Jim, if that's what you want for your life, you can do that, but I've got something better for you. Mm. And so at that point, I remember shutting the book, getting up out of the library, walking over to Comer Hall, which is where my major professor who's going to direct my doctoral study was. And I just said, Dr. So-and-so, it stops here. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know that I can't do this. So graduated, went back home and had a 15 minute conversation with my pastor. And he just happened to get the week before a brochure for the journeyman program. With the International Mission Board. With the International Mission Board. And he said, uh, in that 15 minute conversation, he said, why don't you think about something like this? Because I really was talking about what I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my life. And so that 15 minute conversation changed the course of my life. He didn't know that. I didn't know that. And as I think back, that's what first awakened me to the importance of these sometimes unimportant events that take place in a person's life that radically change them. I went to, as a journeyman, I met my wife. I went to South Korea, was exposed to some things there that I could never imagined in my life. And then at that point on, God began to move me toward ministry. Let me stop you at this point in your story. So what I've gathered is, is you made a public profession at an early age, right. but it, it wasn't from the heart. No. It was kind of going with friends and kind of going sure. with appearances. Cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity, great way of putting that. And then you realize later in life, mm -hmm. kind of a, a, an emptiness mm -hmm. in your heart, uh, purposelessness, I guess, right. and, and, and God reached out to you. And I was interested in, uh, there was a point where you, you, you just felt like you didn't know where else to turn, you didn't know what else to do, mm -hmm. and God reached out to you. I, I heard a, uh, I read a quote the other day that said something to the effect of, oftentimes when we're at the end of our rope, that's when triumph comes. You know, so, so oftentimes we get to a point where we just feel like we just can't take it anymore. And sometimes we, we have a tendency to want to give up, but you just have to hang on and know that God's in control. And your story is a great example of how God knew where you were. Mm -hmm. God knew what you were going through. God knew what you needed to hear. And, and he God came it, through at just the right time. Place at that moment, not before, not afterwards. And then it's fascinating to me to, to, to hear the story about your friend. Yep. And so it's, it's neat to be reminded that God uses just regular people yep. to intersect people's lives at just the right time with just the right message and the difference that that makes. Yep. And you, you actually see that all through scripture. Mm -hmm. Think about Melchizedek with Abraham. Um, you think about Barnabas and Paul's life. I mean, you think about people that just came, came across the lives of yep. people that, that God had a plan for 
at just the right time with just the right message that really led them on the path they needed to go. And that, you experienced Ananias, that. Ananias and Saul. You know, for me, yeah. it just highlight as I began to move in ministry and later my testimony as I began to be a minister and a missionary, that forced me to recall that to look at people that I meet with that same filter. Sure. There's people that will come into my life in an instant, and, I'm, and I may consider it an unimportant event. Yeah. But if I'm not intentional about those events, I will miss the opportunity to change a person's life yeah. with a small interaction on my part. And so that's really framed how I look at people when I see people. You know, I think about, you know, we've, we've given you the, the role of community outreach. Mm -hmm. And so you're really kind of on the front lines, your office being located, of course, in the CLC. And mm -hmm. oftentimes people would just walk up to the building. Right. And so you're the ones who are interacting with people who, who just walk in. And, uh, but you've been there to a point of being in a place of hopelessness and God intervening in your life. And so, you know, as I hear your story and as I think about that, I mean, you, you God has perfectly suited you for that kind of a role. Right. Because you've been a beneficiary. Well, it was like when I came back from the IMB, when I decided the Lord led us back here, the real struggle that I had was my identity. Yeah. You know, I was a missionary for almost 30 years. Right. So what is that role? Do I what role do I have here in the U.S. in the yeah. church or anything like that? And for the longest time, I, I guess a, almost a year and a half, I really tried to get my hand around that until the Lord finally indicated to me. He said, "Jim, here's the thing: the call I placed on your life to do what you did in Santiago, in, in Korea, and then later in Europe, in London, it's the same call. Hmm. I've changed your geography. So the the passion that God has given me to lead me into those areas is the same passion I bring here." It just happens I happen to be in this geographical location. And that role that I have now is just a reflection of the same role that I had overseas, where it's to look at lostness, to find ways to engage lostness, to see people come to Christ, to grow in Christ, and whatever it takes, and see them as people, to see them as personal people, individuals that God has loved. And for me, this experience overseas as a missionary really fine-tuned and burned away a lot of extra stuff. Yeah. And one other thing I will say of those who served overseas can echo this. One thing of being overseas does, it forces you to evaluate and burn away a lot of extra stuff that you carry with you mm. in ministry. So. It gets simple. Yeah. It's simple. It's yeah. personal. Yeah. And you have to take it as personal. And when you understand it that way, it changes the perspective. It's no longer just a question of putting plans together and organizing plans. I'm very good at organizing plans, but I learned very quickly through my experiences that the plans don't make the impact. Mm. They're tools to use. Right. It is seeing people and seeing the people those plans are focused and measuring how well they're impacted with the gospel and looking at those individuals. One of our points from this morning's message is that we need to say yes to God, not the assignment. Right. Sometimes we, we're more worried about the details of the assignment but we say yes to God, and that's what you've experienced. I, yeah. I want to go back. Um, you talked about being a journeyman. Yep. Yep. And so talk us through your uh, call to full-time missions from the journeyman program. Because well, the journeyman program you know, well, is was, a short-term program. I was, I was, I was yeah. a student ministry for two years yeah. and began to think about what God was going to do in my life. And another turning point in my life was my Korean pastor. I got to know the Korean culture. Mm -hmm. We're a very, just a very homogeneous culture. and kind of understood why in the world God was using these people the way he was. Right. To reach the world. Yeah. Until my pastor finally invited me one evening to go and join him on a prayer mountain. Every every major city and most towns in Korea have have, have a prayer mountain outside the city. And this is as the church is beginning to explode in Korea. Exactly. Right? Yes. Got you. And so I went with this pastor. He invited me to go up on a mountain to pray with him. And I'm thinking typically, oh yeah, I'll go up, we'll pray a few hours and come back. No. Every Friday night that pastor would go up on that mountain yeah. all night. Wow. Every Friday and pray by name for his congregation, mm. pray by name for the people in his city, mm. pray by for his country and for the world. I'll be honest, I was up there for a couple of hours in the cold, in the dark, my knees were hurting. After about two hours, all I could think about was how, how much, how my legs hurt and my back hurt. And I was a young man, 21, 22 years old. This guy was 55 years old wow. every Friday. Now I don't want to put the burden on you either, Chief. Yeah, but thanks. Every thanks. Friday night, all night, yeah. all night, rain or snow, sleet or sail, whatever, he was up there praying. And I began to see that's how God changes things. Mm. That's what God, and he's not the only one. Men and women were up there praying and, and prayer became a powerful, demonstrated uh, resource in my life about the power that God can use through men and women devoted to praying and seeking him and willing to obey him. After that, I came back and I came back knowing God was going to call me to ministry and I went to seminary and began to pastor in East Texas. And uh, that was another pivotal point that I had. I remember that was going okay. I was learning my ropes and kind of getting used to it and getting into the rhythm of being a pastor. 
until one episode happened and I realized I was kind of moving away from depending on God and depending on my own skill set. Until I remember sitting in the service one morning, Sunday, had the sermon ready prepared and I'm sitting there and the choir is singing their special. I've got about 40 seconds before I have to get up and preach. And God told me in that 40 seconds, Jim, you're not going to preach that sermon. That's not from me. Oh, wow. I'm thinking, well, Lord, what am, gonna, what, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> I gotta, yeah. no, I said, and he said, in essence, I've got the sense from the Lord. I don't care what you do, but that's not my sermon. So I, for me, it was a pivotal point of obedience. I was either going to obey God or I was going to go with the motion and go with the easiest thing to do and preach it and disobey. And so what I chose to do at that moment was just a life-changing moment for my moment, even though, for my life, even though I didn't know it at that time. I stood up in the congregation, looked over the, the group of people in the church. I said, folks, I have a sermon to preach. God has just told me that I'm not to preach this. I've got nothing to say today. Let's pray, sing a hymn, and we'll go home. But from that point on, God began to work in me and that church in a way that uh, was phenomenal. In a point that I was, what I thought was going to take seven or eight or nine years to do in that church, he did it in two and a half or three. It gave me freedom to go overseas. And so we began to explore that, went to Santiago, and then the rest of the story there, uh, being a, started various roles in, in South America, mainly going as a church planner, and then as a strategy coordinator for the center part of Chile, about seven or eight million people, and then uh, missions mobilizer, where I helped the whole national convention develop their missions plan for sending missionaries. And then through that, seeing the need to realize that we don't need to be sending as many missionaries as we thought from South America because we've got millions of immigrants who've left South America already and are living around the world who are Christians. And so that God led me into diaspora missions, which is to plant my life in Europe and other places where we had already existing groups of believers from Latin America who were living next door to unreached people groups, immigrants from other unreached people groups. And we began to work through those Latin Americans in Europe and throughout Asia, Canada and others to reach and engage uh, Muslims and others with the gospel through these Latin American believers. And so I spent six years doing that and saw some, God knew some phenomenal things. But it was all boiled down to that obedience to the Lord, even though it's costly. And I, can, I will never forget that moment of standing before that congregation, either having to, it was a clear choice. I am either going to obey the Lord or I'm not. Yeah. Like we talked about this morning, you had yep. those moments of kind of as Blackaby calls them a crisis of belief, mm -hmm. and then you adjusted your life to God's plans, right. and and you found purpose and meaning in adjusting to Him instead of trying to do things on your own. Yeah. I, I know uh, just from some of our conversations before, when you were on the mission field, yeah. you had some pretty uh, pretty close well, calls, pretty scary well, things. So talk, talk to us about that, because a lot of folks don't really, you know, we don't really think about life overseas yeah. on mission. So tell us yeah. about some of those things. Well, on the, on the downside, you, when you go overseas, when you make that decision, in essence, Chip, you are, in essence, saying you're dying. Hmm. Because at that point, when you go to different places of the world, there's no guarantee you're going to come back healthy or you're going to come right. back alive. Right. And so you make that choice up front. My daughter has just gone through that. She's going overseas with the IMB and they had to sit before her. She had to sign an acknowledgement that she recognizes that when she goes, she's going into a dangerous world and that danger could cost her her life or her health. Wow. And so you make that decision, but it's different when you actually see that before you. In one episode, this my oldest daughter, when she was seven years old, we were there in a, in a game, we are watching. I was gonna be playing in the next game and we we're watching that go off. And that was when President Bush came to Chile and a bomb blew up just about 30 yards in front of us and killing a person right in front of us. And I was gonna be on that field in the next 15 or 20 minutes. And your daughter was there. And my youngest, oldest daughter was How there. How old was she? She was about seven or eight years old. Wow. So she and she saw, saw that. that. Oh. And having to deal with that and then her sister's going through that. And then her and one of my, my youngest daughter dealt with cancer. And we had to deal with the fact that one of the, the, the best prognosis for the oldest daughter was a 50% chance of survival. And Lord was gracious in that and saved her life. And she's doing well. She's got three grand, she's got three children. All the girls are doing well. But there's also a time when we went through that, the same daughter, three girls, we were doing it, uh, another episode we were going through. And I was in a meeting and so Lori drove the girls home and it was during the middle of a crisis situation in the culture and there were bombs going off and she, they were trying to get home. And a part of the town that was really up in an uproar and riots and they were having burning tires and turning cars over and she was driving with three blonde little girls into that. Oh. So Lori had to take the initiative to back up in the dark, cross the median and go back the other way and finally find me back at the church where I was at. And we camped there and just situations like that are continuing. And we're not the only ones. People have lost their life. Lori and I both have lost people that we've known, colleagues who have been martyred for their faith or martyred overseas and killed overseas. And, and I've dealt with people when I was in Colombia and walking and talking with leaders who came out 
of a red, very dangerous area of the country, and we're going back as pastors. And I knew then, when I talked to them, and they knew, and I knew, this was going to be the last time I would see them, because more than likely they were going to be killed, because they were trying to depopulate that part of Columbia at the time. And some of them lost their lives. Mm. Good friend of mine. And so, um, but there's also the promise that Jesus gave us. and said, when you leave and you, you give up family, parents, house for my sake, I will more than abundantly re bless you a hundredfold. And while my children did not grow up with their physical cousins, they have hundreds of MK cousins all over the world that relate to. And while they, did, they, while they weren't near their aunts and uncles physically, they are now in a world surrounded by hundreds of aunts and un missionary aunts and uncles that provide that for them. And yeah. those whole experiences, God has always been faithful. And, and He's always kept us there. And by staying there, we were able to see God work in some powerful ways by simply staying the course and staying engaged with what He's called us to do. And I've had so many colleagues, at least one or two that I know about in particular, that having made the decision to leave or change because of fear and anxiety, I've talked with them afterwards and even one of them said to me, Jim, there are times I wake up at night and I ask myself, what have I done? Now they're okay, God's used them, but never the way they could have. And for me, it's an interesting ride. I take an Alabama boy from the deep south Gulf Coast and following Jesus when I chose to follow him, the ride he has taken me on, the things he's allowed me to see, the things he has used me to do and to be a part of are amazing. I can't even describe how God has honored and blessed that decision to obey him, even through dangerous times. Yeah. And, uh, but blessed times too, because I've seen people come to faith and I've seen multiple generations of believers and multiple generations of churches all starting with one or two men. I've seen a man who was a garbage collector, the back of a garbage truck, get captured by the faith. And within two weeks had 21 members of his family following Jesus oh, at home wow. house churches. That's incredible. You know, and That's incredible. You know, those are just exciting things. And you, I would have missed that if I'd taken an easier road or a different path. But that simple obedience of saying, God, I will obey you no matter the cost. It's not lip service. It's what people, I think a lot of people don't understand. You know, we, we mm -hmm. uh, you reference cultural Christianity. Yeah. I, I think a lot of times we, we're kind of led to believe that, that when we get saved, that is the absolute pinnacle of experiencing God. Oh, no. When in reality, it's the starting line. It's the beginning. There are so many mm -hmm. opportunities to experience God but the key is, as you said, it's, it's saying yes to Him. It's, those, mm -hmm. it's when we obey Him, that's when we're just yeah. opened up to a whole new world yeah. of, of how God's at work. I, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, you know, you talk about the mission service, you talk about the call to die, which mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a hard thing, I think, for us to kind of wrap our minds around because right. you, you don't generally think about that when you're taking a job uh, at a bank or at a medical clinic or mm -hmm. uh, at, at a, you know, a, a business office. but going overseas on mission, you're really wrestling with that. Yeah. As I hear you talk about that, and then I hear you talk about your daughter. Mm -hmm. I, 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 when it's me, I feel like, okay, I, I know what the risks are. I, I, know, yeah. I, I, I know what I may be sacrificing, and I'm okay with that. But when it's my child, yeah. that's, a, that's a much tougher thing to try to rationalize in my mind. So I'd like for you to kind of walk us through your process because you, yeah. you I mean, you saw yeah. bombs go off. You saw friends of yours who died. You saw mm -hmm. just incredibly difficult things. Yeah. And then your daughter comes home one day and says, Daddy, I want to go over. I mean, how, how did well, you process my, through My that? first reaction was, as a dad, I'll be honest with you, I want sure. her in Kansas. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I want her in Kansas. Absolutely. I tried to talk her in Kansas, but then again, She's grown up and watched all this. Yeah. And if you talk to any one of my daughters, you know, there are some that have talked to them about what you missed and the things you've not had by being overseas. Right. Every one of them will tell you they would not trade that experience for anything because they were able to see God's hand at work. They were able to grow in their faith. And really, as I looked at it, for me, there was no question because my children follow Jesus as I follow Jesus. And it's not, it's, my job is not to protect them my job is to know that when they follow Jesus, they're obeying Him. And if God leads them down a path as He led me, I have to trust the Lord that He knows that path, whatever that path may be. In missions leadership, sometimes you're writing job requests. I wrote some of those too, for men and women to go into places that you know is dangerous for them. How do you 
make fit the idea that I'm asking someone to consider going to a path and going to a place that I know is dangerous. It could cost their lives, the lives of their children. And that's part of what it means to follow God. You either, either trust God with those individuals and trust that they're following God because the gospel needs to go to those places. I've all thought all along that we are praying for an awakening in this country. We're praying for God to change our country. Well, I've never in my study of church history have never seen an awakening that took place without cost. And part of that cost is our willingness even here. And that's one of the things I think the Lord brought us back to the U.S. to be a part of. If we're part of this, if God, we are praying for an awakening here, are we prepared for what He may lead us through to bring that about? So that our testimony under anguish and under pressure and under pain will demonstrate to the people around us, this faith is real, this faith is powerful, this God that we serve can change lives. It's not just a cultural thing we play. And for me, uh, as I deal with my daughter, that's part of where it came from. I, I'm excited for her. I know that God has her on a journey, whether that journey is long or short. If something happens, I will grieve. But I have learned and understand that God is, leads her as He leads me. And even God asked, told me, and as, as I began praying about this, He said, Jim, do you think I love her any less than you? And obviously the answer is no. Right. He loves her far more. And if He takes her down a path that, causes, that brings her to a place of difficulty, I will trust God that He has that for her for a purpose because mm -hmm. He had it for me. He protected my life, but He didn't protect the life of others that I've known, the health of others that I've known. And so coming back here to the U.S. was also a call to die because coming back here, we had no idea what we'd be doing. We had no idea I would be at First Baptist Jackson. I had no idea what I could have been without jobs for two or three years and destitute. But I learned early on, and this is my life experience, that it is always better when you hear God speak to obey instantly and immediately. Mm. Don't debate, you don't discuss. And when by doing that, that simple little view of life, that simple commitment on my part, God has blessed my life immensely and brought me to a place that I love. This is a great place. Yes, I enjoy being here. God's blessed me here. But more than that, God's called me here. Yeah. Well, God, God's not interested in maybes. No. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love the story you know, about your daughter. And, and I think one of the neat things about that is she knows what she's going into. She, she knows the risks because she's lived that life. But she saw God at work in you and your wife. Yeah. And, and, and it, in her mind, the reward of experiencing God is greater than any sacrifice yep. on her end. And that's, that's, a great, that's a great testament to parenting. I mean, that's, yep. we're not all called to live overseas, but we're all called to live the Christian life in front of our children yep. for them to be able to I think see. the dynamic is the same, Chip. Yeah, I mean, it, right. the dynamic is the same. The, the issues are different, the pressures are different, but it's the same dynamic that we're called to be. We are the disciples of our family, right. our children. Absolutely. We're the models that they follow. Uh, we, we need to wrap up. Only got a couple of minutes, but I just, quickly wanted to get to this. Uh, as you made the transition from overseas here to First Baptist Jackson, I know that you felt a real burden about the United States of America yeah. and what God was doing here. Share that real briefly. Well, you know, as I began to work overseas and see what God was doing, I, you know, I've said to several people, we were seeing acts type stuff take place. And all of a sudden this situation changed. We were given the opportunity and God said very clearly, I want you to go back. And my first reaction was, why? Why? I'm, this is great. And then God really showed me a vision. I, 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 and very quickly, I was here when Katrina hit, and I was in my parents' house on the Gulf when they flooded with Katrina. And I remember the moment I was dropping one daughter off in college in Birmingham and going south on the interstate, the only one going south. You can see the storm coming in. And, uh, and so you see the clouds, you see everything going on. And then lightning bolts, and so I went into that. So as I was praying about coming, God showed me that same vision. He says, this is what is my coming. I need you and I want others like you to be there, not to take it away, but to help and walk with people through that. Mm -hmm. And what struck my heart was I've spent my life in sharing the gospel, engaging people around the world. And it's kind of like Paul talked about in Romans when he thought about his own, he considered cursed by God for the sake of his brother, his people. And for me, we were compelled to come back because what I saw God doing, I wanted Him to see do with. I wanted Him to see. I wanted to see Him do with my people, my home, my culture, and I couldn't do that overseas. 
I couldn't do that there. So I had to come here. Trusting God, we came back to be a part of that. I'm committed to making disciples. That's for me, there's the key answer going forward to reproduce the life God has given me in the lives of others around me. So the first thing I did when I got to First Jackson, begin to identify some men and women to walk with. And we've been doing that ever since. Well, I, I appreciate all that you do. Uh, listen, I, I'm so glad that you've tuned in with us tonight. Uh, you get a picture of, of what I've been able to experience with Jim Spy. This guy is the real deal. And I, I love him, and he is such a great friend and encouragement to me and to so many of you. And it's just been great to have the opportunity to hear a little bit of God's story in his life. We want you to tune in next week. Next week, Amanda Slack is going to be our guest, and, and she's got a great story about how God used the church to really wrap their arms around her in a really difficult time. And you're not going to want to miss that. So thank you for joining us tonight.